Good morning, everyone. Good morning, everybody. My name is Luis Ariaza. Thank you for coming today. Before we begin, I would like to read to you the AFL-CIO Code of Conduct. The AFL-CIO is committed to providing an environment free from discrimination and harassment. We ask all meeting participants to embrace our values of equity and equality and conduct themselves in this meeting consistent of those values. Anyone who thinks they have experienced a discriminatory harassment or otherwise unacceptable behavior are urged to, to contact a designee if you have any concerns. Human Resources Director Matt Carroll. Thank you. Good morning, everyone. Good morning. All right, get the energy here. Thanks, Luis. I thought you were gonna. I thought you were gonna give me a shout out or something up here. Uh, my name is Jason McCurston. This morning, I'm here representing uh, the Lynn Teachers Union. Uh, you know, the American Federation of Teachers. I've been. Uh, woo yeah. Been a part of that uh, that union since for about 20 years now, and. Um, this morning, I was just asked to share a few words with you, uh, a little bit about um, my perspective uh, on unions and, and, and why they're so important. And I think that uh, right off the bat, one of the things that I'd like to share is that the reason I even ever became a teacher and uh, walking right out of college and out of high school, going to college and knowing that I wanted to be a teacher one day. And uh, Luis, actually, who just uh, kicked us off, is actually my student, which is pretty awesome uh, that we get to be here today. But it's one of the things that unions do so well is that they bring uh, community and how to impact the community front and center. And I believe that that's one of the things that uh, not only attracted me to teaching, but certainly is one of the major um, talking points of what unions do for all of us. And so um, I'm really interested in benefiting and enhancing my community, and that's one of the reasons why I became a teacher. And one of the things that the unions that we have, especially from my experience working with the um, Lynn Teachers Union and American Federation of Teachers, is that they really help us to bring a collective voice of unity and strength uh, around us. And so uh, one quick example that I was thinking of actually came uh, on our flight over here uh, yesterday afternoon, Luis and I. Luis is a, a, a career and technical education student at the high school I work at, and he plans to also be in a union one day as an electrician. And one of the things we know uh, very much to be true is that any time that you have an opportunity with the, to work with the student, there's always a lesson to be learned, and uh, both for you and for the student. And we were, it's just kind of crazy that this is really, ha this really happened on the flight where we just uh, organically started talking about wages and how much people earn. And we were talking, we kind of inevitably sort of landed on how much money his parents make. And it kind of was a, a striking point for him of a realization of what a living, manageable wage looks like. And we can't say enough that uh, this is really one of the, the most important things that we know unions provide for all of us, is a living, breathable, manageable wage that's built around equity and, and comfort so we can all live this wonderful American life that we're attempting to live as people. And um, you know, for me, that was a, 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 an important moment because it just shows uh, what I've seen so much in the last five years or so as a teacher. I, I actually help, one of my positions is uh, a SkillsUSA advisor where we help to close the skills gap uh, that's one of uh, my main jobs every day of my life is helping young people focus on closing those skills gap and stepping into unions and thinking about those things. And I think so many more young people are thinking about that. And I think that as Luis uh, just in that conversation was thinking about what a living manageable wage looks like, it was a great connector for me because it was about that realization of what unity and strength and collective voice and uh, managing 
wage and good wages that unions represent and have represented for me as a teacher for the last 20 years, but something I'm really excited about that's going to be uh, something he's going to be able to learn and how he's going to be able to live his life with meaning and purpose going forward as well. So thank you very much. Uh, good morning, Union family. Yes, uh, I'm proud to be here representing my union, SAG-AFTRA. So I'm gonna... Uh, I've been a member since 2009. My name is Gabriel Kornblue, uh, DC born and raised. Uh, I'm gonna do my best to bring the drama and make my fellow, my union members proud. So keep the noise going. Um, and we're, I, we're currently on day 47 of our TV and motion picture strike alongside the Writers Guild of America. They're on day 120 of their strike against the AMPTP today. It's the first dual strike in our industry in 50 years. Um, I primarily do voiceover, so um, this is a little bit new for me, uh, even as an actor, but I do wanna, if you'll indulge me, just take a second to take in the power in this room right now. Um, it's a power of our deep resilience and resolve as union members in the face of solemn hardship of striking and fighting for our rights. Um, one day stronger, one day longer. That's right. <clears throat> uh, it's the same power we felt at our strike events that we've been doing all over the mid-Atlantic the last month and a half. It's the same power uh, growing in every union hall and place of employment across the country, the power seeping into public consciousness right now as interest and enthusiasm in the labor movement starts to quickly grow again in this country, in big part thanks to millennials and Gen Z. Um, it's the power of our strikes and our unwavering unity acting as a beacon for other workers struggling to win back the value and safety that has been slowly taken from them by their corporate overlords. Visual effects workers are organizing at Disney and Marvel in our industry. We are with you. Thank you for standing with us. Animation studios and production assistants are organizing. We're with you. Thank you for standing with us. As Chris Smalls, the president and founder of the Amazon Labor Union in Staten Island says, we're looking to our right, we've got your back. We're looking to our left, we've got your back. People in our industry are, and beyond are seeing this moment and saying, hey, we deserve the ability to organize too. We deserve a fair wage and fair treatment too. Let's experience some of that union difference for ourselves. This could be our fight and our moment too. And it is, this is every worker's moment. It's the rebirth of a movement. I like to say joining and getting engaged with my union was my gateway drug to community and class consciousness. I've been a SAG-AFTRA member, that's right. I've been a SAG-AFTRA member since 2009. I've been afforded legal protection, safety on set, work-life balance, what a concept, good wages, and a shot at great healthcare because of that union difference. It's invited me to engage in civic duty, intangible problem solving and teamwork with my colleagues at a time when so many of us are feeling disillusioned by the state of American political divisiveness. It's given me perspective on how collective action and mutual aid are the only ways we earn our power back from our employers after the pandemic laid bare how little big business cares about the safety and li livelihood of its workers. It's only gonna change if we make a change, right? I'm living proof that life is better in a union. The union has also brought me back to my family roots, and as I finish up, I just wanna honor those who came before us, not just those who walk ahead of us. My grandparents, Hi and Joyce Cornblue, are with me in my heart right now. They were labor organizers and educators in Michigan. Thank you. Um, and as unionists, they would never hesitate to share stories of worker power with me and to point out where society had tricked me in my youth into thinking greed and opulence were the goal at the sacrifice of the collective. That our value as humans were based on our value to shareholders and that violent competition, subjugation, and economic exploitation were simply normal and acceptable under the oppressive dome of corporatism and unchecked capitalism. Like them, we're all storytellers now. We're all organizers now. 
we have the power to spread the gospel of the union difference and the obligation to deprogram as many folks as possible from the dehumanizing necessities of unchecked wealth and greed. It's never too late to tell that story of how collective bargaining can help us at a time when we need it most. And uh, just like the WGA, and just like we sag after winning a fair contract, the labor movement's paradigm shift back to worker power isn't just a matter of if, it's a matter of when. Hot labor summer may be ending, but that just means we're gonna move into we will win winter. <laughs> That's right. Solidarity spring after that, Union Strong 2024, and eventually, as my grandparents used to sing to me, simply solidarity forever. The fire is gonna keep burning, we're gonna keep cultivating this moment until all workers get fair compensation for their work, fair treatment, and the opportunity to live happy and healthy lives. To quote uh, my favorite movie about unchecked technological abuse and corporate excess, I just wanna to say to uh, our employers who are refusing to bargain with us, hold on to your butts. <laughs> hold on to your butts because this movement's gonna keep rolling and we're gonna take back what we are truly worth from these corporate dinosaurs and keep the fight alive together for past generations who carried us here and who still stand with us in spirit in this very room for the young people currently revitalizing the labor movement and for the future generations who will carry the flame. One day longer, one day stronger. We've got your back. Thanks for having our back. I'm living proof that life is better in a union. Thanks for having me. Hello, everyone. <laughs> I'm Shamaya Francis. I'm representing Local 26 of the International Brotherhood of Electrical Workers. <laughs> um, I work there as a telecommunications technician. I started in 2019 and just recently graduated from the apprenticeship program. So to me, that's super exciting that in, what, two, three years, I already am at the top of my trade. So that's pretty awesome. So. Yeah. <laughs> So I decided to join the union because I left school. I did not know what I wanted to do. I kind of went to school because, you know, that was just the next goal. You know, you got just like, hey, maybe you graduate high school, you go to college. So I did all those steps. I'm like, wait a minute, a job. I have no clue. So my dad, he's an electrician, and he's been a member of the IBEW since I was younger. So it was funny because I remember, like, seeing the logo and hearing about it, but I didn't really know you know, all the benefits and like everything it had to offer until I joined, of course. It's like, you know, I'll give it a try. You know, I knew that I could do the schooling and that would be giving me that goal I was looking for. You know, I didn't want to just work for a company and almost waste time, you know, with no, no real set end in mind. So I knew with this, I could get skills every single day that I can take away with me. So, you know, I'm investing in myself and I'm getting to invest in a career that's going to, you know, have endless opportunities for me. So what's really cool, though, is that I just got to go to the uh, IBW Renew Conference, which is electricians that are under 35. And it was really just refreshing to see all of those other young people who are in the same boat as me, where, you know, maybe we went to college, maybe we didn't, but we joined the union and it's just totally changed our lives. So, you know, a lot of people can just, you know, go do your nine to five, which I did for the first couple years. And it was amazing. You know, my company, Cabling Systems Incorporated, they saw a lot of potential in me and they allowed me to move up. As long as I was willing to learn, as long as I was willing to try, they gave me those opportunities. And that's the same thing that the union does. If you're willing to learn, if you're willing to put in that time, they will let you advance and they will, you know, help you develop in your career. So seeing all these other young people, like I said, who had the same goals, had the same love for the union, saw a lot of union tattoos on people. Like, that was really funny to me, but super cool just to see people who are as passionate as I feel about it. Anytime I have a friend that says, oh my goodness, uh, I don't know what I'm doing for work, I'm like, well, 
I mean, remember I told you about the union? Like, you could try the IBEW, you know, just because I figure at least give it a try. If I hadn't tried it, I wouldn't have known. And if I hadn't gotten more involved in the union side of things by joining clubs and meeting other members just, you know, outside of my daily job, I wouldn't have realized how many aspects there are and how many opportunities there are beyond, you know, being in the field and being in the labor or even just working in the office at your company. There's politics, there's marketing, there's production, you know what I mean? Like you can have any type of career inside of the union and you have that collaboration, you have that safety net and you know that you're working with other people that care about you and we all have the same goal and that's to progress forward. So honestly, it's just, it's changed my life dramatically being a part of a union because being around so many people who do have the same goals and values as me, even though we don't really know each other and being able to just come amongst them and everyone, it feels like family, you know, it's so, it's odd, but it's refreshing, you know what I mean? So just, I will say not only has it changed my career goals because I don't know what I want to do, but I know I have endless opportunities of what I could do. So having that job security, having that confidence, I can take away just, I mean, yesterday I installed a new light and a dimmer switch in my room just because I was like, I know how to do this. You know, that felt like, you know, just even that felt so cool to me. You know what I mean? So my mom's like, what are you doing? Like your dad lets you do the thing. I'm like, yeah, I know safety stuff. So, you know, just... <laughs> So it truly has changed my life in so many ways and I try to push it on younger people because if you don't know what you want to do, there's no point in just sort of looking around aimlessly or just not working. You know what I mean? It's like go in there, start making money. They're going to teach you everything that you need to know every day. Like they're not going to set you up to fail. They want you to become the best. So I say everything, it's better in a union. <laughs> I should just say, get uh, ditto behind those young workers and sit down. <laughs> but let's, let's give a round of applause. Our, our labor movement is in good shape. We have a bright future, thanks to Shamaya and the speakers before her. Let's give them all a round of applause. <laughs> all right. Thank you. I would like to just take a moment bef before I begin just to recognize some people who are with us uh, this afternoon. First of all, we have with us a good friend of organized labor throughout this country, the U.S. Trade Ambassador, Ambassador Catherine Ty is with us. <laughs> Ambassador Ty, thank you. Thank you. We also have a good friend, a good friend, one of the strongest and activists unions in this country, SEIU, their president, the president of the two million activists and fighters from the Service Employees International Union, Mary Kay Hendry, with us. And this next sister is somebody who I refer to as the dean of the AFL-CIO Executive Council. She wakes up every morning she wakes up every morning to think about what she could do with her million and a half, uh, two million members, the largest affiliate of the AFL-CIO, but she thinks every day on how they can improve the quality of education and create a safe space for the children in public education throughout this country. President Randy Weingarten of the American Federation of Teachers. Look, but I want to thank all of you for being here and for those of you who are joining us out there on live stream, welcome to the House of Labor. As we kick off Labor Day weekend, you know, it's a holiday that many of us look forward to every year. It's a day that's rooted in resistance and a day that's rooted 
in history. It's a day that for us to remember that it was the labor movement that marched and sacrificed to end child labor. We challenge inhumane working conditions. It was the labor movement that created safety standards. Think about it. We transform grim, dangerous jobs into good family sustaining careers. Industry by industry, unions help build the middle class and we should never forget that. We should never forget that. It is the union movement. It is the union movement in this country that wake America up every morning and tuck it asleep at night. But Labor Day is also a time of, of year where we can reflect on the recent progress working people have made transforming our communities and our country by standing together in unions. That's what we do. We stand together. The words are injury to one is injury to all. In the labor movement, that's not just a slogan. That's the way that we survive. And it's also a time for us on Labor Day to take stock and reflection on the American labor movement. You know, when President Shuler and I was tasked to lead this federation two years ago, we wanted to create an open, an inclusive labor movement. A labor movement that was able to connect with all workers in every sector and in every community in this great country of ours. A labor movement with women and people of color at the center of everything that we do. And with working people at the center of the economy and national policy. Layers and I envision a movement that would resonate with workers at the start of their working careers and with workers at the end of their careers and everyone in between. And President Shuler will be sharing some incredible findings in just a minute on how that movement is growing. Every day, more and more working people are finding out that it's the labor movement that is the solution to low wages and unsafe workplaces to inequality and discrimination. The labor movement is the only institution in America that has the infrastructure and the reach to address and vanquish oppression in all of its ugly forms. That working people standing together and standing up for one another are an incredible force for progress at work, in our unions, in our economy, and in our democracy. See, President Shuler and I know firsthand the power of a good union job. It lifted both of our families from a life of poverty and put them on a path to a solid middle class. Those union jobs, changed Liz's family's life and my family life, and it changed ours. And we want every person to know the power of a good family sustaining union job. Believe it, life is truly better in a union. So, once again, I just want to thank you all for being here and joining us today. And at this time, I have the privilege and the distinct honor to introduce a person that I have had the pleasure of working with over the past two years. Her vision, her commitment, her clarity of purpose regarding our movement and its future and, on, and her unwavering belief that it's better in the union has distinguished her as the leader that we need to build the movement at this moment. Brothers and sisters, siblings, let's welcome the president of the AFL-CIO, President Liz Shuler.
so much. Oh my gosh. Thank you so much, Fred. You are a true partner. Let's give it up for Fred Redman, the best secretary treasurer of the AFL-CIO. Good morning, good morning, good morning, everyone. This brings me such joy to see you all this morning and especially hearing from uh, the workers that we heard from this morning. And I just wanna say to everyone here in the room, welcome union family and friends and allies and partners. Welcome to the House of Labor with this beautiful mural here, stunning. Um, and I wanna thank everyone watching along in virtual world. Um, thank you for being a part of this new Labor Day tradition. This is the first inaugural, we hope. So each year, we are going to come together and talk about where working people stand in this country. And the story that we're gonna share with you today at this inaugural State of the Unions is our story. Our story is working people. It is the story of a number, 88%, which I'm gonna come back to in a few minutes, but first, I want to reflect on what we just heard from the incredible workers we just heard from this morning. Every day, I travel this country and I talk to workers. I'm talking to workers in unions, of course, but I'm also talking to working people who aren't yet part of a union. And this is what I hear from them. I don't feel good about my future. I need to make more money. I wish I could afford a home. We're hearing a lot about that. I need a stable job. And I wish I had some power over my work and my life right now. There's a reason that song, Richmond, North of Richmond, is the number one song in this country right now. For a long time, working people in this country have felt powerless. They've been powerless. But here's the truth that we're gonna talk about today. Working people are reclaiming our power. Yeah. Working people. Working people are taking on the companies that have exploited us for a long time now. So the state of the unions, the state of the unions is on the rise. with every strike, with every picket line, every win we deliver for workers all over this country. Now, my first job coming out of college was essentially gig jobs all pieced together, two and three jobs to make full-time pay. And one of those jobs was as a clerical worker in Portland, Oregon, where I grew up. And it was at the same place my mom worked and my dad worked, Portland General Electric, the local power company. My mom worked as an office worker as well. My dad worked as a power lineman. And he was in the union. And you almost didn't even need to see the card because you felt it when those linemen walked around. The power they had. They knew their voice was respected. Our clerical workers, on the other hand, did not have a union. And it was frustrating, um, the same way I hear young people and, and workers today talk about, this feeling like you should just be grateful that you had a job, this feeling that you were being taken for granted and not really seen, certainly not heard. <laughs> and so I became an organizer. I became a part of this incredible team of mainly women that tried to form a union to help build that collective strength so we could demand more more pay, but also more respect. And when the company found out about the union drive, guess what happened? They punched back with this fierce anti-union campaign. And it made everyone afraid that they were gonna lose their jobs. And I guess it, you know, it was disappointing, but maybe not surprising, that we didn't win our election. But in that loss, I guess it's not really a loss because we learned so many incredible lessons and lessons that I take with me today. Lessons that these workers already know that the idea of a union might sound complicated, but in reality, unions are just a group of people coming together. They're about each of us becoming the most powerful version of ourselves that we possibly can be. 
And there's nothing better than finding that power alongside the people that we work with and being a part of something bigger than ourselves. That's all a union is. It's that simple. Now, workers have been living on the edge in this country. Workers were told they were essential during the pandemic. Remember this? Everybody's out with their pots and pans. They were told if they worked overtime and got us through this crisis, it would pay off. Workers who bounce from gig job to gig, gig job, who know that they are one bad break away, a car repair, an unpaid sick day, from not making rent. And they look at a future that feels really uncertain. There's a climate crisis that has them working in 110 degree heat, massive challenges around technology and artificial intelligence, attacks on our democracy and our basic rights. So we have to be really blunt about how we got to this moment, about the forces that got us here. First, we have corporate greed and inequality at levels we have never seen before. 70 years ago, the average CEO made about 20 times what the average worker in this country did. And just a few days ago, we put out our annual executive pay watch report. Any guesses on today's pay ratio? Any guesses what that is? Four, I hear 40. It's like a bidding war. 272 times. A CEO makes 272 times what the average worker does. Let me ask everyone in this room, is it because they work 272 times harder than the rest of us do? Does it make sense to anyone in this room that Jeff Bezos makes in seven seconds what an Amazon warehouse worker makes in a year? I love it. No! <laughs> that he has enough money to rocket himself into space while half this country lives paycheck to paycheck? That kind of inequality is not logical. It's not rational. It hurts our country and it hurts our world and it has to end. That's right. Second, we've seen the quality of American jobs be driven down for decades. Jobs have been sent overseas. Our American manufacturing workforce has decreased nearly 40% in the past 40 years. Gig work has replaced stable careers. Jobs are pieced together without an employer. Now, we've talked about corporate greed. We've talked about our jobs getting worse. The third force that got us here, we've seen a systematic attack on our rights as workers over the past several decades. Right to work legislation in, in dozens of states, Supreme Court rulings like the Janus decision, the list goes on and on. No, these forces are not new, but I'll tell you what is new. What's different about this Labor Day is the awakening happening all across this country. It's up in Detroit, where just a few days ago, 97% of our UAW members said they were ready to walk off the job and push back against the big three. Ready, ready to, ready to fight for a day once again where good auto jobs build our middle class. It's the Teamsters and the historic contract they just won with UPS. They stood their ground and they won. It's in Starbucks stores all over this country where two years ago we had zero unions and where today we have more than 300. Thank you, Mary Kay Henry. And the courageous Starbucks Workers United. It's on the picket line with SAG-AFTRA and the WGA in New York City, LA, Atlanta, Chicago, all over this country. But when I was up in New York City, I saw that everyone could see what was happening. 
with actors and performers and voiceover standing their ground. And then you had taxi drivers honking. You had food delivery workers cheering us on, construction workers chanting right alongside all of us. It's been a long time since this country has seen workers united like this. A long time. We have seen more than 200 strikes so far this year already. And that involves more than 320,000 workers, right? That's 10 times more than even two years ago. Every industry, every red state, every blue state, everything in between. Now, I told you I feel this energy, but obviously I'm the leader of a national labor federation, so I might be a little biased, but... Washington is a town that runs on data and polling. So we did our due diligence. We went out and we talked to people all over this country. And I wanna tell you what we found. It isn't just organizers who support unions. It isn't just people on picket lines who support unions. It is the people of the United States who support unions. That's right. You'll see in the data, more than two-thirds of people in this country believe in unions. Do you know how hard it is to get two-thirds of Americans to agree on anything? Let me put it another way. More Americans believe in unions than like chocolate ice cream. And vanilla, too, in case you were wondering which was more popular. So a few minutes ago, I mentioned the number 88. I did graduate from high school in 1988. Um, but everyone should leave this room remembering the number 88. Why? Because in our data, 88% of young Americans support unions. I just, just need to say that again. Nine out of 10 Americans under the age of 30 believe in unions. That is an eye-popping number. But when you think about our history, it's actually not that surprising. Because you can look up and down this federation at how unions started, and more often than not, whether we're talking about 19th century women in textile mills, 20th century African-American sleeping car porters, or 21st century tech workers, you will trace it back to a couple of 20-somethings who were fed up, right? Who were willing to put it all on the line. And that's what this next generation is doing too. Because they look up and down at our unions, at our nurses and our teachers and our janitors, our iron workers, museum workers, our public sector workers. And they see the same thing. Unions work. Unions make people's lives better. It's better in a union. And I have, I'm like Fred, I have never been more confident that this generation is going to build a labor movement as strong even stronger than any we've ever had in the past. And we're gonna get there together. Now the first thing we're gonna do is we're gonna bring everyone into this movement. If you wanna know what a union even is, we'll walk you through it. If you wanna join one at your job, we'll help you do it. If you wanna build a new union of your, of your own, one that looks nothing like what you see represented here today, I could not be more excited to see what you build. And I'll be standing there ready to help you. We are in the middle of one of the greatest transformations of work in our country's history. More tech jobs, more startups. Our unions, though, are transforming along with it. So if you're watching and you're sitting at a desk in an office and you're thinking to yourself, well, my granddad was in a union. It's really not for people like me, though. Ask our tech workers what a union does for them. Ask 
the 5,500 minor league baseball players who won their union with the Major League Baseball Players Association last year. Call them. Call me. We're here. We're here to help you. There is something else also being transformed in this country. If you haven't noticed, President Biden is leading a movement to rebuild America. And if you're looking at a career in the construction trades, you could not have better timing. This is the infrastructure generation. These are historic investments, trillions of dollars coming down the pike, thanks to President Biden. An investment that is happening because our labor movement pushed for decades, thank you. And that means millions of jobs. So the question now is, what kind of jobs will they be? Every single job with these big investments, construction and transportation and manufacturing, all up and down the supply chains, service jobs, like cafeteria workers that are gonna be a part of these projects. Every single one should be a good union job. And I want to give a shout out to my sister AFT president, Randy Weingarten, who has such incredible vision on connecting these jobs on how we educate young people and prepare those pathways. And who I might add has led the AFT to more than 55 organizing wins already this year. Incredible. Now the second thing we're focused on, thinking forward. Taking on these big challenges that will shape the next few decades. Now let me remind all the technology executives out there, we paid for the research that led to these AI breakthroughs. It was American tax dollars, workers tax dollars that helped make these innovations possible. So we better be damn sure that the benefits and the wealth created are shared by all of us. That, that it makes our lives easier, that it makes our jobs better. That is not how it feels right now though. We feel afraid that technology is gonna make us earn less. It's gonna make our jobs worse. It's gonna dehumanize us. We feel that way for a reason though. Workers in places like Amazon warehouses can't take a bathroom break because they have to keep up with an algorithm. There is another way forward where we have a seat at the table, where AI helps us do our jobs better where new technology actually works for working people. Listen to us, include us. And while we're talking about challenges, we cannot ignore the challenge our democracy is facing right now. Yes, we will turn out next year for President Biden in the most historic labor mobilization of our time. Yes. But we are also going to be a 24-7, 365 political force. And we saw what's possible a few weeks ago in Ohio, didn't we? That's right, where, where these extremists had put something called issue one on the ballot for statewide vote. They wanted people to think it was, it was innocent, just a small procedural thing about amending the state's constitution. But this labor movement, our movement, saw it for the attack on our democracy that it was. The attack on reproductive rights that it was. And we drove a historic turnout. We won and we pushed the extremists back. So we will not be silent while extremist politicians attack our rights, our right to vote and have our votes counted, our right to read the books we want to read, 
our right to think and speak freely on or off the job. We will show up and organize and vote. And I don't care if it's an election for dog catcher or president of the United States, we will be there. And if you're a dog catcher running a pro worker campaign, call me, uh, we'll turn out for you. So we know democracy affects everybody, but another thing that affects everyone and is on everyone's mind is our climate the future of this planet that we live on. This has never been an easy area for our labor movement. We stand with all workers and we will continue to demand a fair pathway so no worker is left behind. But when it comes to these new sectors, offshore wind, green hydrogen, electric buses, we are going to set the standard right now, at the beginning. It's not one or the other, protect the environment or have a good job. It's both. We cannot win without good jobs. We cannot win without Americans on our side. So we are organizing those jobs already. Up and down our coasts where offshore wind is taking off, in the deep south where EV bus factories are being built. That's right. And just unionize. Thank you, steel workers. I see Roxanne, bluebird workers, courageously standing up, forming a union. So we're making sure that standard is set and that these are good union jobs. So we've talked about bringing people in. We've talked about the challenges of the future. And here is the third area that is so, so critical, and that is making sure that this movement belongs to all of us. For generations now, the richest people and companies in this country divided us along the lines of race, gender, sexual orientation, immigration status. Even worse, they convinced us to divide ourselves while we fought the culture wars with each other, they made off with billions of dollars that our hard work created. We live in a world where every woman loses $400,000 to the wage gap over the course of a lifetime. Where a black woman makes 64 cents on the dollar that a white man makes for doing the exact same job. Latina women, 57 cents on the dollar. We came out of COVID determined to address the inequities and disparities that were felt in communities of color all over this country in housing and healthcare and education, criminal justice, employment. We are not there yet, but this movement can get us there. This movement can get us there. And this has to be a working class movement for right now. And when I look at our picket lines, I see people of every background linked arm in arm. I see workers who know an immigrant doesn't stand between you and a good job, a billionaire does. wage disparities that I mentioned, the union difference is what solves them. It's what cuts into that gender pay gap. It's what provides a safe workplace so nurses have PPE instead of garbage bags in a pandemic. It's what gives workers good health care and benefits so that workers have paid sick leave and don't go bankrupt because they need to see a doctor. It does not matter who you are Unions will work for you. A younger worker, an older worker, it's better in a union. Black, white, Hispanic, AAPI, indigenous, it's better in a union. Immigrant or fifth generation American, it's better in a union. LGBTQ+, it's better in a union. 
<laughs> unions, are, unions are how we drive real lasting change. And I'm not 88% sure, I'm 100% sure. And I have seen it. We have proven that over and over again. Right now, we are on the rise. And if you're a worker out there who wants a better life, come be a part of this movement. We're gonna keep growing our power, we're gonna keep winning, and we're gonna keep building better lives for ourselves and our families. Thank you so much for being here. Thank you. Thank you for being here. We are not done. We are, we are ready. And we're actually gonna hear from our workers another time. So you've heard from me. We wanna do something a little different today. It's just not about some talking heads on a stage. We actually want you to hear from our workers directly. And Fred and I are actually gonna have a, a discussion up here on stage. Um, and then all of you in the audience, we wanna make you a part of it um, and invite you to ask workers questions and, and engage in a conversation. It, it'll be short, because um, I know time uh, is precious here. But with that, let's bring our workers to the stage and we'll have this uh, discussion. Fred, come on up and join me. And get your questions ready. Is that right? Everyone can hear me. Fantastic. So this is a little different format for us, but we thought, let's mix things up a little bit, right? Let's do something a little different here. So I'm so, so honored to have you all with us today, and your stories were so powerful, um, and I think it really brings home the union difference, right? It's better in a union, hearing from each of you. And I'm so happy to see Luis up here, CTE student, who... Um, the youngest person on the stage, of course, but uh, clearly has a bright future ahead. And so um, I just wanted to ask Luis, um, I think you're a rising senior, right, in the electricity and um, wiring program in Lynn, Massachusetts. So thank you for coming down to be here with us today. So young people, we were talking about this number of 88% and how pro-union young people are. And I just wondered if... You could tell us why. Why do you think that is um, from your perspective? What's drawing young workers to unions? So personally, I know people in the electrical program, they always revert to the union. Everything is just a union. Their ultimate goal, mine as well, is to revert to the union, right? I think the livable wage, the fact that you can support and raise your family and then also not help your parents, but like your loved ones as well. I think just that in general makes us want to join the union. Fantastic, fantastic. Um, and if you could tell someone out there who doesn't really understand the importance of unions, um, like say one of your elected officials, you know, people who sometimes attack unions, um, what would you tell them to let them know why unions are important? Well, union is union. You know, we're all together. We work as people together as tr strong human beings. And people will always hate on what we believe in. But I believe that the union is the right option, so I will stand firm. The union is where I want to be. I know it's a livable, it, has, it brings livable conditions to everybody's lives, so if everybody could join a union and come together, there, there wouldn't be any problems. So I think it's just, you know, I think it's like- So true. Because okay. unions do bring people together in, in ways that um, I always say bridge the divide, right? We're all kind of, um, often in our different camps and political philosophies, but everyone can agree that having a better life, making better wages, having health care um, brings people together. Thank you, Luis. Thank you. Fred? Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Gabriel, uh, in terms of SAG-AFTRA, oops, 
Okay, is that better? Okay. Um, Gable has been a union leader here in the Washington Mid-Atlantic and a voiceover actor. In terms of sag after, you know, folks cut on the TV and they see actors, uh, you know, performing in films and go to the theater and watch actors performing in plays. In your profession, Gabriel, why does the union make such a great difference? Absolutely. Thanks for the, the, the question. Um, I think, you know, the reality is that we are artists. Um, and storytellers, and we're a reflection of culture and change. And um, those are things that I think we, you know, take for granted uh, a lot. Even myself as a consumer, when we're clicking on our television, you know, when uh, we're paying our subscription services, when we're dropping our dollars to go to the theater, um, you know, where is that money going? How is it going to the people who built your entertainment, your escapism from the ground up brick by brick? Is it being distributed fairly? And I think um, a big part of this movement that I think isn't talked about enough is just like a greater consumer consciousness and consumer awareness around how our products get to us, how the companies that we patronize um, treat their workers. And I think it's on all of us, not just union members, but allies, people interested in getting in the union, and people who are just consumers, which is all of us, to sort of realize that, you know, um, every industry is made up of majority working class work labor force, um, and we're all struggling to get by. And even if you see us on TV or hear us uh, in film, um, all these stories are coming out about how so many working actors are struggling to get by. 86% of us are not making the healthcare threshold of $26,000 a year. Um, and um, even, you know, and I think that's been a big stigma for us as, um, as actors and performers is, you know, the idea that like, oh, actors are all Hollywood, they're all wealthy, they're all elites, and that couldn't be further from the truth. And I actually wanna wear that stigma proudly because we've been trying to break that, and I think we need to break that in every industry. As I said, all labor is skilled labor. Uh, I think we're so ingrained in this society to think that, you know, <clears throat> something to judge other types of labor or to think something is beneath certain people, and the reality is all labor is skilled labor, and even folks that you see on your screen uh, are folks that are coming out with stories that they are not being paid. You recognize them on the street, but they're not getting paid anything, barely anything in terms of residuals or in terms of the amount that their content is being consumed. And so um, I think it's really important to recognize that, to fight that stigma, not just in our industry, but in all industries, and um, to have an organized force like our union representing 160,000 members. We're, we're a union of storytellers, being able to get that story out there and connect it to the broader labor movement. Um, I just, uh, I'm so grateful for that opportunity that uh, the structure of our union gives us. And I just want to say again, because I love to keep saying it, the union is us, the union is the workers. It's not some amorphous entity for folks that are just starting to learn about unions or want to get curious about unions. It is you and I, it is us as members building this together. Um, and so uh, I just love to remind folks of that too. Thanks Great. for the question. Thanks, Gabriel. Putting the you in union, as they say. <laughs> Um, so I want to go to Shamaya because you had talked a little bit about how the union changed your life and I might just throw you a curveball question too if it's okay. Um, first of all, um, what Luis said, I want to know why are young people so excited about unions and your peers that you talk to and, and why do you think that is? And then secondly, what a labor movement to connect with this 88% connect with this 88 of people out there? What could we be doing differently or better? to really make that connection and have people see that the labor movement's a place for them as a young person. So, I think this is on. So, I, my opinion is that younger people, uh, they strive more toward collaboration and I feel like we see that a lot in many aspects of the world, like, you know, the company like WeWork, you know, where we have a lot of these shared office spaces and, you know, I feel like the world in a lot of places is just so much more team-based versus just building 
the individual person in their individual unit and their individual home. We're kind of trying to, you know, bring ourselves together more. So I feel like a union really hits those points for people because it gives them the skills to still work for themselves because everyone does want to be an entrepreneur now, it seems. So I think that helps as well as that safety net, being able to work for yourself if you choose to do so and you know, just being able to bring all these ideas together. Like I mentioned, I went to that conference and it was so interesting because we're all members of the IBEW, but each of the locals, you know, everyone brought their own challenges that they had. So, you know, it's cool to be able to meet one of my sisters from California and, you know, she actually got to bring her baby to the conference because, you know, her union, they accommodated for that because they might have more policy in order to help their members with, you know, uh, uh, like, you know, childcare and things like that. So just being able to come together, you know, to unionize and really understand what people's problems are, not just have a broad generalization where someone at the top is just making decisions, but for us to all come together, share our struggles, share what we've tried, what works, and then, you know, we can adopt that into our systems, you know, because we all do share a lot of the same struggles at, you know, the end of the day. I think you, oh yes, so what I would tell people is, you know, there's so many perspectives in the world, it's just natural that when you have more heads behind something that you're gonna come up with the best ideas, the best ways of doing things. So I would say go union because you're getting a larger perspective, you know what I mean? You're going to hit your target market, you're going to satisfy more people, which will then you know, satisfy yourselves. You know, they, a lot of times the people at the top don't realize that, you know, we are the ones who make everything function. So you need to help the workers. You need to keep the gears greased or whatever you want to call it because it, nothing would happen at the top if we weren't doing that. Well said, thank you. Jason, as a high school teacher and a Skills USA advisor, you know, we look around the country, we see a serious attack against public education. Could you talk a little bit about the attack against public education and how the union can make a difference in terms of beating back the type of attacks that we're seeing today? That's a tough one. I didn't get a layup to start here. No. <laughs> um, you know, I, I think that uh, one of the things that, that we've seen so much of is that people, anytime a teacher asks for something that they actually need, <laughs> that we actually need to do our job effectively, um, it's like we're crying, we're asking for more, we need too much, oh, teachers this, teachers that. And it's, uh, it's amazing because when you think about when COVID first struck, um, you know, all of a sudden there was this outpouring of love that teachers are so important and what would we do without our teachers? Look at them, they're saving us. We're all going out of our minds. And then soon as uh, soon as that makes a little shift and we say, hey, how about we get better buildings? How about we make sure that we can, um, the air quality is better? How about we improve the supplies? How about we improve things like, you know, the necessities really? I mean, like we're not, Teachers in general are never the kind of people, for the most part, uh, and I think anybody, if you know a teacher in your life, because all of you probably do and you have, you know that they're not asking for anything exorbitant or extravagant. We're just looking to do the things that we can, so we can best uh, help those, you know, those young people around us. And so um, to kind of bring that back, I think, you know, the attack on public education in general, it's just astonishing, right? Because um, for so long we've been doing so much with not enough and still achieving excellent results. And now the expectation is that we'll have even better results with still not much more. And I think that every teacher I know uh, wants to be better wants to be more amazing, wants to make more impact, cares genuinely, their hearts are full of love, and they do this job because they wake up every day excited to see young people that they care about. Wow. And, and so I, you know, stop the nonsense, right? I mean, unions are so important because without them, we wouldn't have 
a lot of those bare necessities that we that we already get and we certainly wouldn't be able to be looking forward to all the other things that uh, hopefully are coming you know that we can continue to use to do that that labor of love and passion to impact lives and make uh, you know like here's a great example uh, future unions even better as well so wow 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 and that is why Luis is going to remember you for the rest of his life, right? We all remember that teacher who made a difference. And, and I'll remember Mrs. him Wilson. as well. Yeah, yeah. Um, so um, we want to open this up for any questions and, and thoughts or conversation. And um, uh, well, this is totally unscripted, by the way, if you couldn't tell. Uh, <laughs> so we're kind of just um, keeping it open and uh, want to field any questions or comments from the audience if anybody has any this is your opportunity Luis is gonna take the stage and answer all the questions and we do have microphones up so usually it just takes one question to get things started Roxanne thank you now. So um, your journey to become an IBW member, really inspiring. And you said that you've been talking to other young people, I'm just thinking about that 88% number, about who are stuck, who may be stuck in figuring out what they're going to do for the future. Is your message sticking? Are other people who are your peers starting to join unions also? Well, I haven't necessarily been able to get my personal friends to join just because they are technically on their own career paths, but whenever they tell me they have trouble, I'm like, well, you know, like I said, you know, don't, don't just sit around waiting for a job. You can at least do this, you know what I mean? You will always have that safety net, you're gonna be learning skills, and you may just love it like I ended up doing it. So I will say though, which has been super exciting to me, is a lot of times when I go to either different union events or I may just be doing something on my own accord and I'll meet a, another female, you know what I mean? Or another young person and, you know, they have no idea about the union or, you know, they're like, wait, you do what kind of work? You know, and they're like, no, I, I couldn't do that. I'm like, no, I promise you can. You know what I mean? Like, as long as you know, you can learn, like how to use basic hand tools and follow instructions, like you can learn to do all of it. You know what I mean? So. It has been really cool to just even introduce other people just on the street, you know, not necessarily people I know, but just introducing them to the possibilities, especially other females who might think this is intimidating or that, you know, it's too much for them, but I'm like, you're, you're laboring too. Like I just found you doing a labor job too. Like you can definitely do this. You probably work harder than me. So, you know, that's been pretty cool to see, you know, the response, you know what I mean? To telling people about the opportunity I haven't been able to follow up with a ton of people to see if they've continued their journey, but you know, just the excitement that I get from them and them wanting to share with other younger people, siblings, friends, whatever, you know, that's kind of one of the best parts for me. And you can't, in the age of technology and AI, a job in the trades has a very bright future. So let's all be thinking about that. Anybody else on the stage want to ask a question, or I mean, respond to that before I um, call on you? Any anybody else as far as your friends and? If that's okay, I just I'll say one little additional thing is you know career and technical education. That's where it's at, folks. Like while well, we're trying to close that skills gap, and we you know all the comments that you even made in, in your speech today. I mean, um, you know, unions your your first line of offense is right there in classrooms all across uh, the United States where you know kids like Luis who have these amazing skill sets will, can only benefit by learning and understanding more about the opportunities that unions uh, offer so that way they can see that vision for themselves uh, as well. So just thought that was important to add. So, so well done. Sure, grab the mic. Good evening, everyone. My question was for, because we see that we have young, um, young youth, high school children in the room, 
and I'm really big on youth also. So the relationship with the union and even high school, because they took trade out of high school, and it don't even give a youth or a child an opportunity to say, hey, I want to be an electrician, and I'm learning this in school, or a plumber. Is there any relationship with the union and high schools? Um, I'm from D.C., so I'm thinking District of Columbia. Is there a relationship? Because that's another opportunity that we can get children um, into the union and uh, allowing them to learn about the union because I didn't know about the union until I was like older. But I'm sure if the union was like when I was young um, around and trades was in the schools, I'm sure I would have been an advocate saying, hey, you need to come work for the union. You know, it's better in the union. But do you have advocacy within the union to go build relationships with high school? We want to hear from Randy, who would be the perfect person to answer this. Well, if, first off, I didn't set up that question. <laughs> <laughs> but, you know, if you look at what you see here from Lynn Vocational Tech High School, which is there are many different programs in that high school. 18. 18, to be exact. <laughs> Including uh, radio and television communication. And that, that, but it starts in high school. It's recreated from high school. We've had, we had to fight over the course of the last 30 years to keep some of these programs. I taught in a career and tech school in Brooklyn, New York, Clara Barton High School for the Health Professions. I taught AP history there. Um, that's a myth buster in itself. <laughs> but the... The point we're trying to do right now is to give kids not an either or, but a both and, which is to create a lot of opportunities, not just from college, not just if they see the apprenticeship program and then they go to it after they graduate from high school, but why not give young adults in high school, junior high school, high school, lots of different opportunities to go to college, to create career certifications like Skills USA does. And frankly, if we don't do it in high school, 60% of kids in the country don't go to college. So we really need, if we want to take advantage, as Liz just said and envisioned and, and gave us a vision of it, if we want to really align the good jobs of today and tomorrow with the potential of workforce, we need to start again in high school. And that is what the AFL, CIO, and the AFT have been trying to do together this year to create, to be intentional about that and create these pathways. But as Gabriel said, you tell a story and you just heard the story of Jason Lewis. Thank you, Randy, so well put. Well, I don't see any more questions and I just wanna thank everyone. Oh, is there another one? I was just wondering, uh, I know the, uh, a lot of the entertainment workers are currently on strikes and on picket lines and what is something people can do to support those striking workers? Absolutely, thanks for that question. So, um, number one is Amplifying and our stories online um, and with your friends and family, um, helping us uh, tell the story of why we're fighting and what we're fighting for. Um, uh, there are a couple emergency funds um, that uh, actors, performers, and writers and other creatives can apply to. Um, so we really encourage folks to do that. One of those is the SAG-AFTRA Foundation, which you can donate to, uh, as well as the Entertainment Community Fund. Um, Ryan, is there a third? The, uh, motion, picture, television. motion Picture Television Fund is the third, so we encourage folks to absolutely um, donate if you can. Those are helping a lot of folks uh, stay above water right now as they're out of work. Um, and thanks to Ryan, also my wonderful the local staff, uh, just uh, want to honor the incredible staff that, that work at our unions too, uh, not just the members. And, um, and I think 
Um, continuing to, uh, I also think media scrutiny, uh, really taking stories with a grain of salt, knowing that a lot of the publications are on the side of the AMPTP or have some motivation to be biased towards them. And I think that's a really good tool just to remember that um, the union is giving us the proper information. And um, so those are ways you can help and just uh, general solidarity. Um, and uh, yeah. Fantastic, use your voice, use your financial resources. Join a picket line near you. And we have a strike map on the AFLCIO.org uh, website that folks can go to. And then of course, I think the funds you were referring to can be found at SAGAFTRA.org probably. Yeah. Yes, and uh, SAGAFTRAstrike.org is a great resource, uh, major hub for all of these resources and for uh, picket lines that you can join as well. We all stand in solidarity with you now, today, for however long it takes. As you said, one day longer, one day stronger. Um, and with that, I don't know if there are any final thoughts, lightning round from the panel, any um, final words for those who are watching about it's better in a union as we head into Labor Day. Anybody want to give us any final words? Luis. Of course. Luis, let's hear it. Well, I think the union, you know, just hearing about it, seeing how these people are so passionate about it, it just makes me so like heartfelt. I'm oh, like, wow. It. It's like, wow. That's awesome. <laughs> I just thank you guys for being here and showing your support. That's what I gotta say. Thank you, Luis. Anybody else? That's such a great way to end. <laughs> Can't say it better than that. That's what we're looking for right there. Uh, so I just want to say thank you to everyone for being here. Fred and I are so honored to uh, usher in Labor Day with all of us together. And we'll be seeing you out there on the streets. And uh, for those from the press, uh, we have leave behinds with the uh, data from our poll. And let's lift up that 88% number, but it's really about all of us. It's about our entire movement coming together and being intentional about reaching out to that next generation. And so I think that's our theme for this year, but knowing that workers are struggling, that we know the answer, the solution, the way to make change is to come together in a union and it's better in a union. So thank you all, happy Labor Day.